When astronaut Scott Carpenter made his fiery re-entry into Earth's atmosphere, his capsule was dragging a half-inflated balloon. What was a balloon doing out there? How did it get tangled up in the spacecraft? It happened on America's second crewed flight to orbit, right at the dawn of humanity's reach into space, when NASA launched a balloon from a spaceship. It was called the Mercury Tethered Balloon Experiment, and it's an all but forgotten bit of US space history. I've been scanning frame by frame through archive footage from that flight, and I finally found it. A picture out the window of the Mercury capsule with a balloon in space. The fact that NASA even flew a balloon out of the capsule has largely become lost. That picture, along with a postcard and a switch in a museum, is some of the very little evidence to show that it actually happened. So what's really going on here? This G.I. Joe Mercury capsule and the wiffle ball will be our stand-ins for Scott Carpenter and his Aurora 7 Mercury capsule and balloon experiment. The G.I. Joe capsule is surprisingly accurate and this wiffle ball is roughly to scale. This is how it worked. The balloon was folded up and sandwiched between two balsa wood blocks and put in a can with a spring. The whole assembly then was put into the antenna fairing, which is this conic section in the nose of the spacecraft. And it's totally not a styrofoam cup painted with a Sharpie. No, no, not at all. When the astronaut threw a switch on the panel, the balloon was spring ejected out. Confetti made of quarter inch mylar discs were packed in with the balloon. When the balloon deployed, the confetti flew out as another visual experiment. You can even see the confetti in some of the pictures the astronaut took out the window. The balloon was then inflated by the reaction of chemicals that were packed inside the balloon. Atmospheric drag, yes, there is still drag in orbit, slowly pulled the balloon all the way out to the full extent of the 100-foot nylon tether line, or at least that was the plan. It was 1962. Project Mercury had flown three astronauts into space in the small, cramped Mercury capsule. Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom on the first two suborbital flights, just up over the line and back down. Then John Glenn flew America's first orbital flight on the big Atlas rocket. Now it was time to expand the program with astronaut Scott Carpenter's Aurora 7. It was to do extensive maneuvering and had an expanded array of in-space experiments and they even tried to spot a giant group of flares fired off the ground. The mission can be thought of as the first working space mission. And it was carrying this, a 30 inch diameter balloon that Scott Carpenter would launch from the capsule. The Y was all about rendezvous and docking. The plans to go to the moon were already underway. Rendezvous and docking were critical. To do this, the astronauts had to see. Remember, this was only America's second flight to orbit. Everything was still unknown. In orbit, you're constantly traveling from day to night back to day. Every 45 minutes, it switches from intensely bright to dark. And the bright is really bright. On our high altitude balloon flights, we've learned to cover every surface with gray paper so it doesn't dazzle out the cameras. Orbit is worse. How well could an astronaut see outside his capsule? Add to that, it's also very hard to judge distance in an airless environment. On Earth, we use the air making things fuzzier in the distance to help judge it. All this could add up 
to problems trying to eyeball docking to spacecraft. Enter the Mercury Tethered Balloon Experiment. The idea was to deploy a balloon from the nose of the capsule on a 100-foot line. The slight drag in orbit would pull the balloon away from the capsule, and Carpenter would take a look. They would have a known reference distance. You know, NASA often will get several things done with one experiment. They put sensors on the balloon line to see how hard it pulled. They would compare the pull on the high side of the orbit from the pull on the low side of the orbit. This lets the scientists make super accurate measurements of the density of the atmosphere in orbit. This is what it should have looked like. However, in the words of astronaut Scott Carpenter from his mission report, quote, at balloon deployment, I saw the confetti as it was jettisoned, but it disappeared rapidly. I saw one of the balsa blocks and mistook it for the balloon. Finally, the balloon came into view. It looked to me like it was a wrinkled sphere about eight to 10 inches thick. It had a small protrusion coming out each side. The balloon's motion following deployment was completely random." Unquote. These are pictures from the robotic camera aboard Aurora 7. You can just make out the balloon and the tether line. These are pictures Carpenter took out the window with a hand camera. The balloon looks very different between these two pictures, and they are very different from the description the astronaut gave and even different from the pictures from the robotic camera. Remember, the capsule was orbiting the Earth going from day to night every 90 minutes with twilight and dawn conditions in between. This makes an object that was less than 100 feet away look very different at different times. A very important finding for a visual experiment. In that sense, it was a very successful test. It pointed out the challenges of seeing an object that is less than 100 feet away. It also showed that how in orbit a trained observer and multiple pictures all of the same event can seem like very different things. This is a picture of the 95 foot tall, 10 foot in diameter Atlas rocket after it separated from the Aurora capsule after launch. It was taken by Carpenter out the window with a hand camera. If it was that hard to get a clean picture of that, it's remarkable that the balloon pictures came out at all. How did a visual experiment become a balloon being drugged down from orbit? Well, several things went wrong. One of them had to do with this little flap on the nose of the capsule. It's called the destabilization flap. It doesn't do much in orbit, but once re-entry starts, it adds just a touch of drag to the capsule. It keeps it from entering the atmosphere nose first, like a badminton birdie. This makes sure the capsule comes in on the heat shield in the back. The other problem was that the balloon only slightly inflated. The drag of the atmosphere at that altitude could not overcome the momentum impacts of the nylon line. The balloon and the line just randomly moved around the spacecraft. It is believed that during maneuvering, the line got wrapped around the destabilization flap. This meant that when it was time to release the balloon, nothing happened and the tether line stayed attached to the capsule. No one was really sure where the line was hung up on, but it couldn't be seen from the capsule. The destabilization flap is right next to the line attachment point, so it was the most likely candidate. When the Mercury capsule re-entered the atmosphere, it took the balloon down with it. There's not a lot of data from the re-entry. The capsule's automatic stabilization system couldn't hold the correct pitch and yaw attitude needed for the re-entry. 
Scott Carpenter used the manual system and went through the remaining fuel. The capsule splashed down 250 miles away from the intended splashdown point. The antenna fairing, where the balloon was attached to, was jettisoned after re-entry to make way for the parachute below, and nothing was left to inspect afterwards. NASA's assessment was that the balloon had no impact on this rather difficult re-entry. I wonder if it didn't at least have a minor impact. Perhaps for a very short time at the beginning of the re-entry, the balloon had an impact on the automatic stabilization system's ability to hold pitch and yaw, especially if instead of on the nose, the balloon line got tangled on the re-entry thruster pack on the back of the spacecraft. This would counter the benefit of the destabilization flap. The partially inflated balloon was roughly the size of the destabilization flap and would have exerted the same amount of drag, but on the wrong side of the spacecraft. I'm still digging in, searching for more flight data to figure this out. The original assessment of no impact may be completely correct. Either way, I think there are still lessons to be learned about re-entry dynamics from this mission so long ago. Always want to squeeze every bit of data I can. You never know what you are going to find. In spite of the problems, the Mercury tethered balloon experiment still provided insight on orbital observations. Mainly, that is harder than they thought. However, the experiment is almost forgotten in the history of space travel. It's almost like it never existed. It's not on any of the models, not on any published diagrams, it's not mentioned in any book about Project Mercury, and it's not shown in most of the artwork. However, if you dig deep, you can find little hints here and there. Here is a postcard commemorating the experiment. Interestingly, it shows the balloon line attached to the re-entry thruster instead of the nose. The Mercury capsule also ejected a flashing beacon to test how far it could be seen. The Atlas rocket carried side pods filled with experiments. You know, all throughout the space program, there were countless small experiments that rode in the shadows of the bigger missions. Some had success, others not. It was almost a space program behind the space program, each adding to the exploration of space and each with its own story to tell, yet lost to history. But if you look, what you might find might just surprise you. Each Mercury capsule was handcrafted and unique. If you look at the schematic of Scott Carpenter's capsule, you can see right here the control for deploying the balloon. Here's the capsule in the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. If you look close, there it is, the balloon deployment switch. Proof that when we took our first steps into space, we carried our balloons with us. And finally, I want to send out a salute to Thomas Varanis, a longtime NACA and then NASA engineer known as Mr. Strangage, who was one of the amazing engineers that worked on the Project Mercury tethered balloon experiment. Be sure to subscribe and thank you for watching. JP Aerospace, America's other space program.